let's dive right in. Welcome to episode three of Blender and Science, or as I prefer to call it, better late than never. In this episode, I'm going to cover a fair bit. I'll discuss some Blender-specific tools and developments. I'll highlight and demonstrate some assets I released a while back, and I'll use them to do a series of full recreations of common battery figures. I'll also be discussing some exciting community developments, and we'll reflect a bit on some recent events. As usual, there are timestamps below. Let's start with updates on Blender itself. One of the most challenging parts of Blender is keeping up with it. There are new features constantly being added, especially recently, but it can also be helpful to hold on to older versions because some add-ons aren't updated consistently. The Blender Launcher is a great tool for managing different versions. Many people I know use it, especially those who are experimenting with new features. It's free and definitely a worthwhile tool. I'll add a link in the description. The interface itself is relatively straightforward to use. You have the library of your own different types of builds, including stable builds, daily builds, and experimental, and you can choose from a variety to download at any given point in time. It's easy to store everything in one place and to quickly access different versions of Blender. I myself run a few at a time and need to trim this back, but it is a nice little tool to have access to all of these kind of at a single click. It is worth noting that I try to make sure all of my tutorials use only stable versions of Blender, the kind you download from the homepage on blender.org. That said, for some of the future Blender and Science episodes, and this one as well, I will use some of the newer features and versions for showcasing what's coming. Again, the launcher is just really a convenient way to manage all of that. Probably the most exciting development in the wider Blender community right now revolves around simulations or loops. These had been previously demonstrated some time ago by Brady Johnston using a buffer technique, but in the past month, it's picked up a lot of attention from a number of Blender users. There's now a prototype of a simulation system that will be coming in Blender version 3.5, and there are more than a few fantastic demonstrations of the capabilities of these systems floating around both on Twitter and in tutorials on YouTube. If you're interested in some particularly fantastic demonstrations of capabilities, I recommend checking out Cartesian Caramel, who some of you may recognize by the name BBBN19. Particularly, go to the live page where there are a number of long session workthroughs showing both the buffer version of this effect and the actual geometry node simulation in version 3.5. In addition, there's the fantastic work of Chris P beginning to explain some of this, and Chris has been working on some of the more exploration-based versions of this, so animation nodes quite some time ago, and I believe also a little bit of spare chalk, but has really renewed some of the interest here in simulation nodes. Very straightforward, very easy to follow tutorials. For some of the more advanced work, there's Entegma, and you can look at the tutorials on creating things like curl noise, very interesting, especially a little bit more math focused. CG Matter has been asking for these types of things for some time, and has been making great use of a number of them. And then Chanterelle, one of the kind of original Twitter explosions of the buffer effect demonstrated this sort of differential growth. And there's also 3D Sing VFX, which goes through quite a good amount of the basics of understanding the particle system. So these are definitely all worth checking out. In our own community, Alex HH, one of the Blender.Science Discord mods, has been exploring many of these new experimental features as well. So if you want to jump on over to our Discord to look at that for a variety of subjects, including visualizing atomic orbitals, creating fully procedural vesicles, and more, that's the place to be. While I think simulations in geometry nodes will have major implications for scientific blender, it's still very early days, and I will revisit the topic when it's a bit more flushed out in a stable or at least stable-ish release. Still, if you want to explore these nodes, the Blender Launcher is a great way to grab the experimental branch, or alternatively, you can come to the experimental pages and download the GeoNode simulation build. Again, I will link this in the description. On the note of stable releases, Blender 3.4 is now in candidate and will soon be the stable version of Blender. It comes with a lot of new exciting features, particularly for nodes, particularly the ability to create named attributes for instances, which is very effective for scattering large numbers of particles and changing their materials. That's been demonstrated to great effect by Joey Carlino by creating Lego blocks out of essentially anything. And this again has been picked up on our Discord to make Lego proteins, Lego beakers, Lego anything you can imagine that's science related. So it's very fun. And it's a worthwhile exploration of how these new nodes are going to work and some of the properties that they offer. In addition, there are some extra nodes that I'm going to be showing off in the demonstration for things like scattering objects inside of volume, something that we've wanted for a very long time. It really makes a lot of figures much easier to make. That will get its own tutorial in the future. Lastly, for Blender news, even though it's been about a month, I want to highlight the 2022 Blender conference. A few scientists even showed up to attend, including our community's own Brady Johnston, who gave a fantastic talk on using his molecular nodes to visualize viruses. 
I'll discuss more about BlenderCon and molecular nodes in the community wrap up at the end of the video, but it was a fantastic event and there's all kinds of stuff that we can learn as a community of both artists and scientists. I'm going to highlight a few of my favorite videos at the end. As a recurring part of the Blender and Science episodes, I want to start including quick tips. Eventually, I will compile these into a larger video, but for now this is a chance to highlight things that don't merit a full tutorial, but are still worth sharing. In this video, there are two tips that I want to quickly share. The first one comes courtesy of Rio Mizuta Graphics on Twitter, part of our community. And very simply, in Blender, you can select lights, right-click, and then adjust the light power. And if you notice at the top left of my screen, the light power is visible. And this is exactly the same power that you would see here, where you would have to change it. So this means that if you're in any menu in Blender, say over here, if I come to the rendered view, I can simply right-click my light, adjust power, and then drag left and right to change the power on the fly. So this is a very quick and easy way to adjust the power of lights in your scene. I didn't know this existed, and apparently a lot of other people didn't either. So a nice little quick tip. The second quick tip involves keeping geometry nodes or shader nodes organized. I know that many people like to use the snapping feature to simply put things in fixed positions on the grid. I'm not a huge fan of snapping, but instead I like to box select the nodes that I'd like to have organized, hit shift and equals to distribute them evenly in a horizontal fashion, then S to scale, Y and zero so that they all line up at the top. I find this is a nice, quick, and easy way to keep all the nodes organized, and eventually I'm going to figure out a way to convert all of that process into one shortcut just so that it can be done with a single click. And when that happens, I'll either release a video, an updated quick tip, or I'll make it a shortcut available for everyone. In this episode, I'm going to work through a few demonstration examples specifically related to 2D materials and batteries. I'll be working with Blender version 3.4 because some of the new nodes that it has make a few of these figure elements very, very simple, and eventually they'll get their own dedicated quick tutorials. Let's begin with an asset overview. I've received a number of requests to create 2D materials, particularly things like transition metal dichalcogenides. In the past few months, I released fully procedural assets for things like graphene and boron nitride, carbon nanotubes, and molybdenum disulfide, or general metal dichalcogenide lattices. In addition, I have some older assets for things like lithium cobalt oxide, and I'm going to use all of these kind of in some capacity for some of the figures that I want to demonstrate today. All of them have a decent amount of flexibility, and they're available for free on my Gumroad page. Let's take a quick look at each of the assets and some of what they can do, and then we'll get into using them to recreate some specific figure elements. In Blender, these are essentially the assets, and you can import them in any number of ways. You can download the file directly from Gumroad and open it and then simply work with it like that. You can go to File, and then you can append from the specific directory by choosing the object. We'll quickly look at that. For instance, this is the metal dichalcogenide file. You'd simply open this, you'd come to object, then you would choose the object and you'd append it into the scene. It would give you essentially this, and then you could control it. For the lithium cobalt oxide one, it's a little bit more involved because it's a bit older. So in this case, you have to import two things. First, the cobalt oxide material, and then there's also a second object that it is connected to, which is the lithium position. So you need both if you actually want to work with both. The controls are also different, and we'll come to that in just a second. The graphene, or boron nitride, and molybdenum disulfide, which is essentially what this was intended to be from just the materials, work in very similar ways because they're built on roughly the same platform. So we'll start with the graphene because it's a simple example. So zooming in here, if I select this, you can see in the modifier tab, I have a number of controls to the geometry nodes. I can change the offset to essentially crop this. I can change the number of units to essentially control how densely packed this is. There's also an option to scale up or down. So if you want to preserve some measure of density, but increase or decrease, you can do it here. There's options to show or hide atoms. There's also the option to change the atom scale. So you can see that there is the ability to assign materials to both atom one and atom two. And these are actually offset to kind of every other. So if I were to change atom one to say boron, and you could see that here, and I could also change the size of that to make it larger if I wanted to stand out. There's also another option down here for mixed bonds. And what that essentially means is if I change atom one back to boron, then I mix the bonds. You can see that the bonds that are closer to the orange atoms are orange, and they split at the halfway point to be black. 
It is much faster if you have it set to zero here because it's just calculating one thing, and then you can individually set the bond material to be whatever you want. So if I really wanted it to be some other color, I could do something like this. You also have options, of course, for the bond size. And if we quickly move over now and look at the MOS2, you're going to see something very similar. So many of the controls here are the same. We have the same cropping tools. We have the same number of divisions, so this will change the density of the packing. But the molybdenum disulfide has a few extra things. So you have this option for number of layers. You also have an option for layer separation. So if I want to have two layers, and if I bring this all the way down to one, or zero rather, they will sit directly on top of each other. So if we come to a side view, not that side view, this side view, you can see that they are all sitting perfectly on top of each other. And if I really wanted to, I could add some separation between them. And this is kind of arbitrary. You can also control the layer height. This is not the same as the separation. This is actually how far the bonds will stretch apart from one another. So if we were to increase this, you see that they will all stretch up. Similar to the graphene boron nitride, I have control over the individual atoms, over their materials, and I can also have mixed bonds here or not. So again, if I wanted this to go a little bit faster, I could do this. And then I could set the bonds to some arbitrary color, something like that. The last one over here is the lithium cobalt oxide. I built this some time ago before geometry nodes was really developed the way it is, and so this is not procedural or at least not fully procedural, it's partial. This uses the modifier stack. So the lithium cobalt oxide setup actually has the lithium atoms, or ions rather, as a different set of things. It also means that you have to have a collection of all of these specific ions. So if I wanted to actually change the size of the ions, I'd either have to go into the old particle system, or I could simply select the ion in question, hit S and then scale it up, and you're gonna see those grow. This is not a perfect system. I will probably remake this to be more similar to the perovskite nodes at some point, but for the time being, this works reasonably well for most figures that you would expect to make, and it has relatively simple controls. You control everything through the cobalt oxide object, and you simply use X to change the number of repeats in the X direction. Similarly, you then use the Y axes to control that, the Z axes to control there, and then you have particle systems that match everything up. And so this is a relatively simple set of figures or figure elements. These are pretty easy to use and we're gonna demonstrate them in some common figure elements for both 2D materials and batteries, nothing terribly complex. I'll also review some of their limitations. We'll start with the 2D materials and you can see that if we look at these figures, there's a number of things going on. So these are just kind of picked from my own collection, but you, know, you can very quickly see how we would make something like this given what we just saw. Put down one layer of the MOS2, have the atoms in the middle be green, make them bigger, and then just simply duplicate that and have one be blue. So let's go ahead and we'll do that very quickly. To do that, I'm just going to duplicate my original object here with Shift D, I'll move it out on the Y axis, right there. I only need one layer. And I think I'd actually like these, in fact, that wasn't the layer, that was the scale. So I only need one layer. I'm gonna keep the scale the same, just to have that density. I would actually prefer this to have mixed bond colors. I think that's gonna look a little bit better. And I'm going to change a few things just to match. So right now I've got the atom two and atom one materials switched. So we're gonna go yellow here. We'll go with the blue here. Do I have a nicer blue already? I do, I'm gonna use my nitrogen blue here just cause it's convenient. And I'm going to, I'm actually going to use no mixed bonds, but I'll scale up the atom two. So let's go with size of four. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Let's go atom one, size of four. Perfect. Drag that up just a little bit. And instead of using two layers of separation, I'm going to duplicate this, bring it up. And now this time I'm going to change that nitrogen material out for something green. I should have lithium in here already. That's perfect. And that was pretty quick. So essentially we remade some element of that figure. Let's go back and take a look at the original. Not quite the same coloration, they use white bonds, so let's just make a note of that. And I also switched the positions of the blue and green so we can fix that very, very quickly. I'm just gonna move this one up, this one down. And I'll settle on doing this in an easy way by just coming to the materials. I'm gonna add in the ones that I wanna work on. So where's my carbon material right there? For the sake of demonstration, I'll just make that white, there we go. 
And I'm also going to add my lithium material. I don't actually want to be kind of that dark green metallic, so we're going to go with something a little bit brighter. That's not bad. And we'll also make our nitrogen material kind of metallic while we're at it. So let's go ahead and grab that one. There it is. This can also be just a, uh, it's pretty bright already. That's pretty good. Let's bring the metallic up on there. Drop the roughness down to, let's say, 0 0.2, maybe 0 0.3. And so very, very quickly, you can see how you could use these assets to make some kind of figure element like this. Not too difficult. Now, there are some obvious limitations. Any of these figures would be essentially the same thing. So you drag and drop, you change the colors, you adjust the number of layers that you want, you add some separation if you need it to. These ones where you have sort of material separation, you have some of these being emissive and some of them not, that's perhaps a little bit more involved and I might do something a bit more manual there. This one's very straightforward. You just add in the colors that you would like and then stretch it along. And this one does have mixed bonds, so that would be pretty easy to do. Same with all of these down here. And this one as well. This is the one that really stands out in my mind as being a limitation of the current model. If I really wanted to, I could go in and I could customize this, and add in a bunch of features, but I couldn't easily add the surface atoms that I have right here. So this is something that you would have to add in if you wanted to. We'll do a quick look at how you might do that. It's going to be a little unscripted and kind of live, so I'm not promising it'll go smoothly, but let's take a quick look. So I'm going to choose, in fact, I'm just going to delete these. We'll duplicate our original object again, move it out in the Y, and I'm actually going to hide these other things right now just because we don't need to focus on them. So let's grab this, come to the modifier tab. I only want one layer, just for simplicity. And the main thing that I need to do is make everything realize. So I'm going to have to bring everything into the scene, and that's kind of where it's going to become a problem. So I'm going to start by moving it into its own collection. And let's see if we can get this to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is come to the Geometry Nodes tab. Might give me a bit of a hard time here because this is quite a bit to process. And one of the things that I've noticed with 3.4, I'm not really sure why yet, but it seems to be very slow when I'm actually trying to zoom in and out on nodes. I haven't had that problem before, so I'm not really sure what's going on. But the thing that we're going to do right here is we're just going to, at the very end of the tree, right before the output, I'm going to add a Realize Instances node. We're going to connect this right here and then we're going to do something that I wouldn't typically recommend which is we're actually going to apply the geometry nodes modifier and so this is where it's going to get a little bit ugly because now we have this whole object and it's full geometry so we can't edit this anymore but the thing that I actually wanted to do was grab all of these top positions and essentially just pull them out to create extra spheres. So I can do some customization here if I wanted to. And the key shortcut in this case for working manually is going to be L because L is going to grab these as separate objects. So instead of having to worry about, you know, selecting the individual geometry, which is quite extensive, I can just hit L. And I can kind of grab whatever selection of these I want. It's going to be very customized, so you're going to have to go through and do this on an individual basis. But from here, what I can then do is I can come into my materials and say, let's add in a new one. And I actually want these to be, let's go with the nitrogen material again. I'll assign that. And now you can see a selection of the atoms on this surface are this distinct blue. I can then also come back in. And one of the things that I don't think is going to work nicely here, if I really wanted to, I could probably try and, yeah, see, normally I would try and select these from the side, but this is actually going to capture all this geometry as well. So in this case, we're going to do a very quick workaround. I'm going to hit L on the bonds. Then I'm going to go with Shift G, select similar by, and I should have an option for materials here if I hit three and change to faces. So there we go. We're on face mode now. Shift G, select similar by material. Right at the top. Then I'm going to hide all of those bonds with H. And what this lets me do is grab all of these top atoms unimpeded, Shift D to duplicate, Z to drag up. I'm going to hit the period key to change to individual origins. Then I'm going to scale down. So they're all going to stay in place where they are. Unfortunately, this is not going to give me an easy way to build bonds between each of these positions, but we're going to kind of deal with that as we go. And then if we Alt H to unhide everything, Come back in, 
We now have our atoms that hover above the surface. You'd have to find a decent way to create bonds between these. I'm sure there's a proximity-based thing. I'm pretty sure you could do this with Brady Johnston's molecular nodes. I might flush that out in a future example. But let's make it clear that these are distinct by adding their own unique material to these. So if we come to rendered view, these should all be kind of light blue. Let's give all of them the nitrogen material. And now you can see that they're all hovering above. The reason that it converted all of the bonds as well is because I actually had all those selected. So I don't want to do that. And in fact, this was a valuable example of a case where you'd want to be very careful here because I was selecting all the bonds by material. So if that was something that I wanted to pay attention to, I'd give these a distinct material. So if I wanted something blue, I'd add in another blue one. Let's just do that right now. And we'll make it a little different just to be obvious and we'll name it appropriately. So top atom material. I'm going to deselect everything because I do not want to be selecting these ones. And then because these are all now unimpeded in a wireframe, I can grab them, assign that material. And just like that, we've got all of our atoms hovering over these top positions. And so this is how you could begin to do some of the customizations for 2D materials. Again, making these things fully procedural for a full set of needs is exceedingly complex and kind of has diminishing returns at some point. If you're going to do it for an individual figure, start with the framework and then customize by applying the geometry nodes. The key thing there is to remember to realize the instances right at the end. Otherwise, the atoms won't appear, the bonds won't appear. And I think that's largely what I wanted to say about 2D materials. I will probably again revisit this in the future. I might make some changes just so that you could add things like surface bonds if this is something that's very prominent. If you work in 2D materials, let me know in the comments if this is a feature that you would like to see, because if it is something that gets enough traction, then I'll probably take the time to add it in. Same thing here with this custom set of materials. I would simply make well, I'd realize the object and then I'd select the ones that I wanted and I'd give them the emissive shader, or I would just maybe do a gradient across the whole thing and try that. There are plenty of options here. I'm not going to work through all of them today because then this video would get very, very long, very fast. And I do want to switch gears a little bit to focus on battery materials. Now, most of the time when we're talking about a battery figure, we're probably talking about a lithium ion battery. It's just one of the more prevalent ones in the field, and they have a few common elements that I want to quickly look at. So again, with the reference board, and for those of you who don't know, this is pure ref, it's free. I like to use it to storyboard things. Battery figures tend to have a few common elements. So you're gonna have some sort of electrodes on either end, which are arbitrarily colored or metal of some capacity. So right here we have copper and aluminum, reasonably standard choices. You'll have an intermediate layer that has either an electrolyte or some kind of solid electrolyte, some sort of separator in between, typically porous. And if we zoom in on these, you can see that a lot of these decisions are kind of aesthetic. So this one, the holes here kind of match up with what they have going on over there. It's not uncommon to see these be porous separators. So this is a approximation of a porous separator. And then the other kind of figure that you tend to see are these space filling models. And I'm personally very fond of these. It's something that I've wanted an easy way to do in Blender for a long time. And version 3.4 kind of has the answer. They're very nicely displayed here. This is one of my favorite covers I've ever seen. I know that this is a specific artist because I've seen some of their other work floating around. It's beautiful stuff. I really love it. If we were to also address the other aspects, so if we're talking about the cathode specifically, such as lithium cobalt oxide, now this one says uh, vanadium carbide, I guess, MXCM cathode. But over here we have kind of what I would imagine is the more standard lithium carbide cathode. So this is, again, a material that you're probably going to want to work with if you're in batteries, and it's readily available. Let's go ahead, and I think I said lithium carbide, lithium cobalt oxide. From here, I'm going to jump back into Blender, and I will essentially recreate all of the elements of this figure in its entirety, because it's a relatively common battery figure. I'll show how to do some of these simple elements, like scattering points on a plane, and this nice little space filling trick. We'll then also look at two tools for making porous separators, and they're both very simple and extend far beyond just batteries. In Blender, I'm starting in a relatively new scene. All I have right now is a kind of plane that I'm going to use as the background, and I'm going to do a little bit of quick setup. I like to work with cycles just because I like the way it looks. I'm going to use my GPU, and I'm also going to drag in a few things. So let's go ahead and pull in some of the stuff using the asset library. And if there's interest in using the asset library, I'll make a more dedicated video about that going forward. This is my particular asset library, so it has a number of things that I have put here. 
including my own molecules. So I'm going to grab my graphene sheet right there. And the other thing that I really want is an HDRI for the scene. So right here, these are all free, by the way, you can access pretty much anything that's in this asset library. I have a few paid things, but anything that is my stuff or these HDRIs was all free. The HDRIs came from Polyhaven. So under the render settings, I'm going to go with film, transparent, and I'll adjust the world strength to be a little bit lower, let's say 0.8. So zooming in here, this is our graphene. If I can ever grab it, I'm going to close this window actually just so we can see what we're doing. Bring that up the tiniest bit so it's sitting above the surface. And the one thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to have layers of graphene. So I want to essentially create a stack. I'm going to do that with a simple array modifier. Close this out, change that to zero in the X direction, and we'll add some height. And I want four repeat units, which is very similar to the figure. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that the atoms are only on the first sheet and not on the subsequent ones. And that is because in geometry nodes, we are going to have to, again, realize all the instances. So if you don't see it in the tree, make sure you have the modifier selected. We're just going to move again right to the end of the tree where the output is. And for, again, that same strange reason, it's lagging when I try and zoom in. It doesn't seem to lag when I do anything else, which is kind of curious. So I'm going to grab the output, move it over to the side, and from here I'll drag out a realize instances, connect this in, and actually let's just zoom in before we connect it. So again, you can see the atoms on the bottom and nowhere else, and as soon as we drag in the realize instances, they're going to jump up a little bit, but now we also have the atoms, so we'll drag this back down, z-axis. And that is essentially everything that we're going to need to do with geometry nodes for this figure. I do need to add a few things. Well, that's not true. We're going to come back to geometry nodes when we make the separator. First, we're going to import the lithium cobalt oxide because this is actually a little bit involved. After you have navigated to wherever you downloaded the file from Gumroad, simply open it, come to object, and then I want the cobalt oxide and also the lithium position. So control and select both of those, append, these are going to be imported kind of at a massive scale, so we're going to have to make some adjustments. The first thing I'm going to do is scale down the cobalt oxide. So the lithium positions will be automatically parented here. And the one thing that you're going to note is that the atoms do not scale with them. So this looks kind of silly right now. We're going to keep scaling, come to a top view, position this closer to our graphene. Because this uses arrays, it's not actually centered. So the graphene actually has its object origin centered here. The other part, there would be cobalt oxide does not. So I'm going to grab the individual ions here. So lithium, oxygen, and cobalt, holding control. I'm going to hit M to move those to another collection, which I'll call atoms. I'm going to scale those down, so just S and scale until we actually have something reasonable. Let's zoom in here. Not quite reasonable yet. Getting there. Again, so we've got one outstanding ion in here that's pretty big. I'm going to guess that's the cobalt. Let's change that. Yeah, there it is. And so now we have something that's at least a little bit more feasible. I'm going to hide the atoms collection. We're going to work with this lattice. It's at a usable size now. So we'll drag that up, actually. Come to a side view. Just move that above the plane here. And we'll get it in line roughly with the graphene. So there, and then just move that out. That looks good. Again, we have to adjust a few things, so we're going to change the number of repeats in the y-axis. Actually, it's in the x-axis that I want, so there we go. Let's just cut that down until we're roughly the same width as the graphene here. That looks good. This is the base of our figure. I'm going to actually change the height of the array here, just a little lower. And now we can add in a few simple elements, including our electrodes. For the electrodes, I'm just going to use the default cube. Scale it down, come to top view, I'm going to move it over there, right to about here, shrink it in just the y axis, and then let's see how high it is. A little bit too tall, so again, we'll move that kind of roughly into the middle. S and Z to scale down. We're just looking for something that's going to be a decent approximation of one of the electrodes. 
That's not bad. And we'll make that flush. Good. I'm going to add just a little bit to this because I like to have a small bevel. We're also going to apply the scale with control A. Then I'm going to make the bevel much smaller. So 0 0.01 to start. Let's say three units there, control two to add a subdivision surface and right click shade auto smooth. Then I'm going to give these a new material. I'm not looking for anything terribly complicated here, just a sort of simple reflective metal sort of texture. And if I was being diligent, which I will, then I'm going to name this electrode and we'll call this the aluminum electrode. I'll then duplicate this, shift D, Y to drag it to the other side of the graphene. We'll add a new color for this, or rather we'll just change that right there. We'll make this kind of an orangey one. And you guessed it, we'll rename this to be copper electrode. Let's check back on our figure to see how we're doing. So we've got one of our electrodes, we've got our graphene for the anode. We have a space in between where we're going to put our porous separator in just a minute. We're not going to add electrolyte. Well, actually, we'll add electrolyte quickly. We have our lithium cobalt oxide for the cathode, and we have our aluminum current collector. So let's approximate, let's say, let's approximate an electrolyte. I'm going to shift D my aluminum electrode. Again, hold down Y so it's locked in that axis. Drag into the center, roughly the center right there. S and Y to scale, something like that. And I'm going to use essentially this entire layer in the middle as my electrolyte. So we'll go ahead, we'll rename that electrolyte. And we'll change the material here. So I already made it its own material. We don't want this to be metallic at all. In fact, what we want is for it to be fully transmissive with no roughness at all. Topology in there looking real interesting as it reflects everything. So to fix that, we're just going to add a solidify modifier. This is how Blender deals with glass. Apply the scale as well so it looks a little bit more uniform. And now we've got something that resembles or could be argued to be an electrolyte. And if you want to make this a little bit cleaner, then you would come down to volume, you'd add a volume absorption, you'd give it whatever color you want, let's say a blue, and then you'd increase the density quite substantially. So let's say 25 to start. Maybe higher. We'll make that a lighter blue. Let's go with 50. I'm also going to change the solidify here, so 0 0.001 maybe. And if I change the solidify, I'm going to have to change the density back, so we're just going to use this for now. This is one way that you could do an electrolyte, and then you could make a porous separator in between. I actually don't want to work with this kind of approach today. I just want to make my porous separator right in the middle. And so I'm going to duplicate this object first, rename it separator, and then I'm going to get rid of the solidify. I can keep, I'm going to get rid of the subdivision and the bevel as well. We're going to hide the original electrolyte and I'm going to grab this, remove its material because I don't need it. And we're going to now return to geometry nodes and do just a little bit of trickery kind of. From here, we're going to go ahead and make the porous separator. It's the easier of the two and it's the more common figure element. So in geometry nodes, with my separator selected and a new tree, I'm simply going to disconnect the input from the output. And then I'm going to look for a volume cube. I'm going to connect this with Alt Shift and left click. And if I zoom out, you'll notice that my cube is too big. So I'm very simply going to hit S and scale this down until it actually fits. So it's a rough outline for now. Don't worry too much about the details. We're just going to get this kind of right to begin with. And with side view, that's too tall. And you can see the edges are kind of warped. That's not really going to be a problem. From the volume socket, I'm going to drag out and create a volume to mesh, to mesh. Then Alt Shift and left click. We have our little mesh in the middle here. We can zoom in G and Z just to drag that in and S and Z to scale it up the tiniest bit. And this is what we're going to use to make our separator. It's going to be very straightforward. From the density side of the volume cube, I'm going to create a color ramp node. And for the factor, I'm going to drag out and create a Voronoi texture. Something like this will be just fine. Then, very, very easily, all I need to do to get my final effect is drag the black toggle up here, and this is going to give me a pretty fully adjustable texture. If I change the scale of the Voronoi, I can get this to be fine or coarse. And then on the end, just so it looks a little bit nicer, we're going to add a set shade smooth. 
If we really wanted to, we could also, of course, add a color by adding a set material node. And so I could choose anything that I already have stored in memory. Could just go with the carbon one right there. That's not bad. I'd actually prefer this to be a little bit more matte and less shiny. So I'm going to undo that for now and just keep it kind of in the generic white. I'd also like it to be a little bit smoother looking. So I'm going to add a subdivision surface or a subdivision. Yep, there it is, subdivision surface right there. So we'll connect that up. Levels of two. And that's not bad. That's a pretty good convincing battery figure. One of the things that you're going to have to run into or be careful about running into is if you try and scale in a specific axis, it's going to stretch the texture. And so if you don't want to really stretch the texture, but you do want to limit it, then you can simply change the volume cube dimension. So let's say I want to shrink this in Y. I'm going to bring that to minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. And so now we have a smaller separator, but we haven't actually done anything to distort that. And this is actually a nice way that you can offset these things. So if I scale this back up in Y, Bring this down even further, minus 0.25 and 0.25. You'll notice that I didn't actually change the scale warping, I just shrunk the whole thing. And so that is a very convenient way to get porous separator figures. These are super common, so that's a nice little addition that you can do through the volume cube node. I think volume cube is in Blender version 3.3 and onwards. So I had originally planned to include a demonstration of this. I mentioned it a couple times probably at this point in the tutorial, but I wasn't happy with any of the experimental approaches that I was working on towards getting it. All of them involved distributing points in a volume and then using it as a mesh cutout. It's really kind of not the best approach. It requires Booleans, which are very slow. You have to kind of be lucky about how everything gets placed. And then even then, Blender doesn't play along all the time. So I'm going to save that for a future video if I have a more concrete way of putting that. But for the time being, the porous separator approach using the volume cube is pretty good for most battery figures, at least I hope it is. And from there, we're going to move on to looking at this space filling model and this distribute points on faces, and that should wrap us up pretty nicely. So back in a new scene in Blender, we're going to start by deleting the default cube. I'm going to add in a simple plane. We'll do distribute points on faces first because it's very easy. All I'm going to do is drag out from here and look for distribute points on faces. There it is. We'll add that in. We're actually going to drag that out. From here, we're going to add an instance on points. Let's use a UV sphere. See what we've got there. These are too big, so we'll drag that down. Point one, zoom in. And I do actually want my original plane to have some shape to it. So we're going to first drag from here and add a set shade smooth. I want to smooth the spheres and not the plane necessarily. I also don't want this to be random. I want a plus on distribution because I don't want these intersecting spheres. So I'm going to change the minimum distance up until no spheres are touching each other. Then I can change the maximum density if needed. And I'm going to make these even a little smaller. Something like that should be fine. Bring that density up. And maybe we bring the minimum facing down. Better. Let's do that. From here, very simply, all we're going to do is drag from the original input geometry. In fact, we're just going to select the input geometry. Shift and select this, control zero on the number pad to add a join. And I want to translate my instances up so that they're sitting on the plane. Cut that and connect this instead. We're going to move this up by the radius of the sphere. So probably not that much even, a little bit less. What do we actually have it set to? 0 0.05. Now all of these are sitting nicely on that sphere. Because they're instances, they won't actually be affected by a modifier, so I can add solidify under this to add something nice there. And I can also add a little bevel, 0 0.01, with two or three units there. And that's pretty good. So that would be very, very quickly how you would get that first figure having all of the points distributed on the plane. Now, the more interesting one, in my mind, is the one where we distribute points in a volume. So we'll go ahead, hide this, with Shift A, we'll add in a cylinder. I'm going to tab into edit mode, S and then Z to scale, drag that in so I've got something with the right dimensions. That looks good. We'll add a new geometry nodes modifier. 
And from our geometry nodes input, we're going to drag out to create a mesh to volume. So mesh to volume. Perfect. And then with Blender version 3.4, we're going to drag out from the volume socket and go distribute points in volume. So this node is only in version 3.4 and onwards. If you don't see it, it might be because you're in an older version. We'll Alt Shift and left click and we see that we've got some points distributed in there. If I bring the density up again, they're randomly distributed. That's just fine. If I want them to be more uniform, I could use a grid. And the one thing that you have to be careful about with the grid is that this spacing controls how many points you get. So if I bring this number down to 0.1, I get a lot more points. This is very useful for a lot of figures, but you have to be careful because if you accidentally drag one of these down to zero, it will create infinitely many points and Blender will crash. For the figure element that I want today, I'm just going to use a random distribution. I'm actually going to use two random distributions. So Control Shift E, keep that. And I'm going to offset the seed by one. And I'm also going to start exposing all a number of parameters because they're things that I would want to use here. So I'm going to have both the densities. Let's see one, then see two, and we'll re relabel these in just a second. The seed, or the random distribution for the first set of particles, and I'm just going to offset the seed for the second one by adding a value of one. So the seed for the second distribution of particles is always going to be a little different than the first one. From here, we're going to instance on points in both cases. So points, instance on points. And for the instance, we're going to use a UV sphere. Connect that up. See, these are far too large. So we'll drop that down by factor 10. And I want to be able to control that radius as well. So radius one. Then we're going to duplicate these nodes. So control shift, or rather just shift D in this case, connect these points. And we're also going to add in set materials for each of these so that I can assign them different colors. There we go. We'll join geometry, control number pad zero here, add a set shade smooth, and alt shift and left click to visualize everything. Now. I'd like to do just a little bit of cleanup here so that I can add in a few more things. I want the radius control for my second sphere, and I also want to be able to assign the materials from the modifier panel. So now we have a relatively straightforward figure set up for making some of these little fully mesh dense figures. We're going to add some names here. So density one, density two, Seed will always be different between the two because I've added in a number that's different, so it will redistribute every time. That just means that you won't get points in kind of the same place, or they're not the exact same place. And then radius one, radius two, material one, and of course, material two. And with that, we can go ahead, let's add in some materials. So the original figure, I think, had a kind of light orange, kind of unsaturated. Let's go with something like this. And the other one was, of course, that nice dark gray or mid gray. So let's do something a little bit darker. Perfect. Now we can assign all of these. So material one, there it is. And material two, perfect. Let's make our density, or rather, let's make the density for material or for second set of atoms a little bit lower. Bring that down to maybe 10. We're also going to make them much bigger, so that's why it's going to be that way. Then we can change the seed for some different random distributions. Not bad. I'm not super happy with the materials. I think they're too shiny, so I'm going to bring the roughness up on both. Just like that. And the other thing that I'm going to do to add a little bit of liveliness to this scene is just pull an HDRI in. So let's go ahead and add some nice lighting for my own assets collection. Here's an HDRI. I'm going to use Brady's favorite asset, the Abandoned Factory. There are actually two. I'm not sure which he prefers. I'm going to use this one. And again, film transparent. There we go. I actually think that gray needs to be a little bit darker. So let's go ahead and do that. There we go, much better. And so that would be a relatively quick way of making this same kind of figure. So let's go back and look at the original. There it is, not bad. Let's add in the top and bottom plates just for completion. And because we built everything on an original simple cylinder, this should be pretty easy to do. So S and Z, we'll just scale that in. 
as it should see, so that we're scaling it out this way. We'll add in a nice bevel modifier there, making sure to apply the scale first. Again, we'll bring that down from the default to 0 0.01. Three there, control two, 50 and Z. Now we have something that looks pretty decent. Bring that up, to kind of a metal texture. And we'll shade auto smooth on this one and this one. We'll give this the same metal material. So that's a very quick recreation of something like that. And we have all these different controls over things like how many of these internal atoms we have, what their kind of random distribution is, which we can cycle through until we find one that we're happy with. I actually like the one we started with. We can change the materials, we can change the radii of the respective atoms. And so that looks not bad. You'll have to check for things like clipping on the intersections, but you know, if you were just rendering from here, you wouldn't be able to tell. That's not bad for a roundup. From here, I'm going to move back into community features. So I know this was a little bit long and rambly. I don't often do these kind of live figure it out as you go formats, and they are pretty reserved for Blender and Science. So this is not consistent with what I would expect of a tutorial. If you would like something that's a little bit more focused for tutorials, just let me know in the comments. I am going to probably do one for distribute points and volume and for creating the mesh networks. They'll be the five minute and faster series, but that will come kind of in the future. Because it's been a long time since the last video, there are a number of community developments that I want to highlight. I'll start with my own, which is that CG Figures has reached 10,000 subscribers. This is a great milestone for me. The channel has seen pretty consistent growth, and there is still fantastic feedback. There's much more to come, so thank you for your support over the past two years. It's been great to see this community grow, and even better to be a part of it. On the Node of Community, I was very lucky recently to speak with George from Barcelona, who simplified a number of my nodes for making graphene and boron nitride. George is also the person who pointed me towards the Blender spreadsheet importer, which was used very heavily in my last tutorial on direct data import into geometry nodes. George went so far as to use this to rearrange the periodic table that I made, which is available for free on Gumroad. His version included a ton of extra parameters. In fact, they were all directly imported from a spreadsheet, which is kind of how I originally envisioned the project, but this is sort of the realization of it. Moving right along with community features, if you haven't heard of Bobby Broccoli, I'm happy to be able to introduce his work. Many of his videos, certainly the more recent ones, are deep dives into science history and are often beautifully told using Blender. The latest video made use of the periodic table I created, and several of the asset designs and tutorial outline decisions were made as part of a back and forth discussion between the two of us about what he needed for his video. Another reminder that I greatly value community feedback on assets and do try to incorporate it. If you want to watch some excellent long-form documentaries on research and the history of research, his channel is definitely worth checking out. You can also now find him on Nebula. And while we're on the note of highlighting outstanding community work, I really want to take every chance I can to point people towards Sam M or at Sam Murps on Twitter. Sam does excellent work visualizing circuits and electronics, ranging from components to full assemblies such as drones, really a fantastic source of inspiration. It's kind of stunning that some of these things are renders and not actual circuits, but they are beautiful demonstrations of what Blender can do in different communities beyond what we sort of more traditionally see in scientific visualization. And moving right along, I want to preserve my tradition of mentioning Arendelle at least once every three videos. This time around, it's not because of the excellent new advanced geometry nodes course, which is fantastic, nor is it for a number of the long-form tutorials that have recently come out. It's actually something from a few months back when Arendelle was on a hunt for accessible Blender themes. I've mentioned before that Blender allows for themes to be imported, which could be customized to account for things like color blindness. Arendelle posted about this some time ago, but I thought it would be worthwhile to echo it again. If nothing comes forth in, from the community, I will likely make this a project in 2023 to the best of my ability. There are two community things that I want to sneak in that came out while I was still recording the episode. The first is Freya Holmer's incredible video on the continuity of splines. This is something that I understand was over a year in the making. It's a beautiful demonstration of the mathematics behind simple and not so simple curves. If you enjoy content that visualizes mathematics, such as three blue, one brown, I really can't think of anyone else who's better to recommend than Freya, and especially this video. Also the one on the beauty of Bezier curves is fantastic. On another Blender-related note, Arendelle has released a video on importing CSV files directly into geometry nodes, but unlike my video, where it does some of the work for you through an add-on, Arendelle covers everything from start to finish for all of the Python scripting. 
So if you want to get a little bit more involved with writing your own scripts, I highly recommend checking out this video. In our own community on the blender.science discord, there's also been a great deal of development and sharing. We have new tutorials from MicroSingularity on sorting points in GeoNodes. There's a variety of tutorials from Entropic covering all kinds of different aspects of using molecular nodes, creating different aspects of animal cells, and all kinds of other artistic endeavors that are definitely worth checking out. One of our mods, Jojo, is planning to release a tutorial on making procedural bone textures using cycles, and there was a recent talk that is shared on the Discord, Blender for Biochemistry, from Dr. Ben Peters, and this was, from what I understand, a workshop in Auckland covering different aspects of visualizing proteins and other biomacromolecules in Blender using some more traditional scientific tools along the way, such as Pymol. Finally, to wrap up the community updates for this year, I want to discuss Brady Johnston's successful trip to the 2022 Blender Conference and some of the exciting developments that have come out of it. First is the reworking of molecular nodes to be significantly more performant. I'm confident Brady will provide a more comprehensive update himself in the not-too-distant future, but for now the results speak for themselves. Using data for an actual bacterial cell from the Center for Computational Structural Biology, Brady has successfully imported an entire bacterial cell, essentially, into Blender using molecular nodes. This is really kind of hard to quantify in terms of how impressive an accomplishment this is and just how far things have come since both of us started posting to YouTube in early 2020. More broadly, the Blender conferences have always been great, and many past videos are still more than worth watching. This year was a right up there with the best of them, and there were a number of incredible talks on topics directly related to science. Without getting into the details, here are my picks for the best talks for scientists from this year's Blender conference. To transition to a little bit of inspiration, comments on where things are going in the future, and then wrapping up. Not long ago, I would have told you that Jeroen Klaus's recent video with Maastricht University in the Netherlands, apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly, was the type of thing that could only be accomplished with Houdini, or would be best accomplished with Houdini, which I understand is his software of choice. Given the recent advances in Blender, as long, along with some of the things that we've seen from our own community, particularly from Alex HH on our Discord, I think it's fair to say that these types of things, these types of beautiful animations and capabilities, especially through Brady's Molecular Nodes 2.0, are coming to Blender very shortly. This is the part where I would normally share my reading list, or the things that I'm working on, learning about. But this time around, I want to close it with some thoughts on AI and automation as it pertains to both art and science. In the past few months, we've seen very impressive displays through platforms such as Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, and more recently, ChatGPT, which is likely going to have the biggest impact on science in the short term, especially in article and grant writing. At the moment, though, I want to focus a little on the art side. To me, CG Figures has always been more of a technical and scientific project than an artistic one. I design assets and make tutorials to help scientists, but I leave the artistic element up to the end user. I kind of see myself almost as more of a programmer in some sense, or a developer. Artists have always been a huge source of inspiration to me and to many members of our community. In fact, I see the broader Blender community as being primarily an artistic community, and I honestly think we're better off for it. That said, we have a responsibility as scientists to listen to that community and to really hear what they're saying. And to that end, I want to strongly encourage everyone to go listen to two podcast episodes on the Proco channel that I've linked in the description. They are a bit long, and they both deal with the emergence of AI art. Specifically, they are this one right here about AI ethics, artists, and what you can do about it, and also the AI aliens have landed. Granted that these are a selection of perspectives, Blender Guru's podcast discusses AI fairly frequently as well, and make no mistake, it is here. It's going to change art, and it's also really going to change science. I also want to clarify that I'm not here to discredit anyone or pretend that getting these AI systems working reliably or easily is devoid of any skill. I really don't think that at all. It's a complicated field, and there's clearly a lot of work that goes into getting a good result. I do not personally work in the fields of AI or automation. I think both have enormous potential benefits to science, particularly to my own field of materials chemistry, and to chemistry in general, which has been carried out with what I view as a very 20th century mindset for a long time. I may discuss that more in the future. Even so, 
As scientists and researchers, we sometimes, perhaps frequently, need reminders that our research has an impact beyond our papers, and that we should, and I would argue, need to listen to the people that our research impacts. I'm bringing this up because I think a lot of what I do with CG Figures, a lot of what our community does on Blender and science is about communicating that science. And artists definitely have a role to play in that. I really cannot speak for all scientists, but in my view, we have a bare minimum obligation to listen. And yes, we should be critical when we listen, but also considerate and maybe above all else, ethical. So if you're working with these tools, exploring them, or especially if you're teaching them, please take the time to consider the implications they have for your own field, but also for those outside your field. It is an exciting time for a lot of things, and there's an argument that the boulder is already rolling and can't be stopped, only guided. I'm really not convinced that's true, because there are a lot of capabilities we have in science that we haven't really advanced, even though I think we could. I really believe that we all have a responsibility of guiding this boulder very seriously if it cannot be stopped, and that the voices at the table need to be diverse. They really need to be diverse, and they need to be multidisciplinary. So make yours heard, and ideally, do good things with it. And I really didn't intend to end on kind of a heavier note, so I want to emphasize that it's been a fantastic year for CG Figures, for our community. There have been so many exciting developments. It's been great to be part of this community. It's been great to see it grow. It's only getting better. I'm confident that 2023 is going to be a fantastic year for scientific visualization in an open source format, and I'm really excited for everything that's to come. I might not be done this year. I may have the chance to squeeze out one or two more videos. We'll see how that goes. But as always, a major thank you to my supporters on Patreon who help make these videos possible. And with that, thanks for coming out. As always, if you'd like to contact me, jump to the comments, come hit me up on Twitter at CG Figures. And until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.